Hi, this is Corey McCarthy, and welcome to a new episode of Fit, Formidable, and Fantastic. That's right. Go F yourself, and happy Friday. Now, in this episode, I'm going to be um, doing a video by request, actually. This is a request that one of my viewers has made for a specific topic, and um, I'm going to deliver on that. In this episode, I will be covering sugar and how it relates to both health and performance. Now, first of all, what is sugar? <laughs> now, you smart asses out there, just give me a minute. I'm getting to it here. Uh, before you guys start jumping in with your smart ass replies, I can already see it coming. If we're talking about sucrose or common table sugar, it is a combination of approximately 50% glucose and 50% fructose, or a one-to-one -one ratio of each. Of those, Glucose is a primary source of energy for the body, um, including, including the brain. While not the sole source, as ketones are the other source of energy for the body, it is definitely one basic source. In a nutshell, the body breaks down the carbohydrates that you consume into glucose for energy. From an athletic standpoint, glucose is the best at refilling muscle glycogen, whereas fructose is more suited to refilling your liver glycogen, and thus it is poor at refilling muscle glycogen and requires a conversion process in the liver, which adds an additional step. Thus, consuming straight glucose would be the most optimal um, form of carb to take in post-workout. Now that said, it is important to note that the existence of the post-workout anabolic window, as it's known, is not gener uh, generally concluded. Um, but are those like myself? But there are those like myself who feel best with a quick replenishment after a brutal session. In fact, personally, I get downright nauseous without something in my stomach after I train, and I mean something quick. So I tend to go for a shake. So, how can one obtain direct glucose? Well, you could just use table sugar, but that again would provide you 50% glucose per serving and the other 50% coming from the less efficient fructose. Even fruits contain varying ratios of, fruit, of uh, fructose and glucose per serving, uh, so they're generally, and I, I, that's an operative word right there, generally suboptimal at refilling your muscle glycogen. There are some fruits that are a little higher in the glucose spectrum, like ripe bananas uh, and uh, medjool dates, for instance. Um, but generally speaking, most fruits are suboptimal at refilling your muscle glycogen. So enter dextrose. Dextrose is pure powdered glucose. That's right, baby. Pure powdered glucose. Raw energy in powdered form. In the references below, I will link to a search result um, at Amazon for a variety of commercially available dextrose products uh, for those of you who might be interested in purchasing one uh, to fit your budget. Now, fructose in excess is hypothesized. I want to emphasize that fructose in excess is hypothesized, emphasize that as well, to cause non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as well as insulin resistance, obesity, elevated LDL cholesterol, and triglyceride levels, which are blood lipids, uh, and, that le and leading to uh, metabolic syndrome. Now, in rats, fructose feedings versus glucose feedings led to raised blood triglyceride levels by 86% in the fructose group. There was no effect on blood triglycerides in the glucose group. Now, bear in mind, that is the rodent model, so it may not play out the same in humans, but it is worth noting. But straight glucose feeding is not without its risks either, so don't um, think that I'm just bashing on uh, fructose here. In one study conducted on men, so on humans, <laughs> But on men, an oral glucose load of 75 grams led to 25% drop in testosterone levels for up to two hours. Now, this study involved a wide range of, of men, ages 19 to 74 years old, and varying glucose tolerances. So there's a good variety in there, a real good uh, mix-up. However, what it did not elaborate on was uh, it didn't specify whether these men were trained, and moreover... Uh, not just trained, but if the glucose was consumed after an intense exercise session. So, given all this data, what then do I actually suggest? Well, everything in moderation, of course, which probably goes without saying. 
Um, you, you know, of course, limit your processed sugar and dextrose intake. Uh, but that being said, proper health can still be maintained with 10% of your daily intake coming from processed foods. So unless you actually uh, desire to exclude processed foods entirely, there's absolutely no health risk in enjoying some processed foods each day. Now, I would limit the majority, if not all, of your sugar consumption, or even dextrose consumption for that matter, to your meal or meals that are generally after your workout, like your post-workout shake and perhaps the meal right after. Um, and I would suggest consuming less than 75 grams of processed sugar or dextrose in a sitting. And that's just going by that study, that study I uh, mentioned before about the 75 gram oral glucose load. Um, for other times of the day, like during your regular meals, I would suggest consuming whole food carbohydrate sources like, you know, fruits, veggies, grains, um, you know, potatoes, starchy type stuff, etc. Thus obtaining um, complementary nutrients and components such as vitamins, minerals, fibers, proteins, and even fats that do not exist in isolated processed sources such as table sugar or dextrose. And of course, which can also impact your digestion, absorption, um, insulin response, etc. So do this within your dietary allowances and barring, of course, any sensitivities that you might actually have. Now, some of you might be asking, what do you mean by sensitivities? Well, some people suffer celiac or have other gluten intolerances and thus would do well avoiding wheat. Others perhaps are genetically inefficient at predigesting starches, as demonstrated in a global 2014 research piece, um, and thus they would not fare well on a high starch diet. Um, and, and actually, on the subject of that particular study, about half, around half the participants fell into the category of being genetically predisposed to not being able to predigest starches very well. So, as a, since it was a global study, on a global slice of life scale, I'd say it's about even at the people who do fine with starches and people who don't do very well. So, anyway, moving forward. All of that being said, carbo are carbohydrates even necessary for protein synthesis? Well, more research is needed in this area, but the current body of research suggests that no. So long as ample protein is ingested in your, for your needs and your goals, um, thus it's really up to you, your body, your diet, and your goals and your needs. You don't necessarily, according to the current body of research, need carbohydrates for protein synthesis. You can, you could even achieve protein synthesis on a ketogenic diet, for instance. Anyway, um, but I want to elaborate and say that you should always work with your body and your goals and not against them. And don't follow someone else blindly who may have different needs and tolerances than you. So, and also bear in mind there is, you know, a lot of people spout anecdotes. Um, you know, well, I did X, Y, and Z and look at me, you know. But it, it doesn't align with the research. And again, that is anecdote. There's probably a lot of factors that aren't being tracked. In a study, you actually have tight observation, you have controls, you have, um, you track the factors, uh, uh, personal factors about a person, you know, like, you know, diseases or, you know, sensitivities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot more controls in place in a good study, that is. So some just random person saying, you know, well, I, you know, I don't care what the science said. You know, I did X, Y, and Z, and I achieved this, you know, it's like, that's just anecdote. It's interesting, and it definitely does inspire further research, um, perhaps studies in an area where, you know, maybe there's, there's a good deal of studies lacking, but anecdote is just that. It's enough to raise an eyebrow, but it isn't conclusive. So don't follow anybody else's routines, diets, etc. blindly. Because, again, they may have different needs and tolerances than you, and there's, there's obviously going to be factors they may not even be aware of or may be omitting. Anyway, that is all I have to say on this particular topic. If uh, you guys have anything you want to add or any questions you want to ask, do please uh, drop it below. Otherwise, I'll see you guys on Monday for a regularly scheduled episode. Stay fit. Stay formidable and stay fantastic. I will see you guys around. Have a good weekend.